Um, anyway, my name is Patrick McDonough. I've been here at Binkley for a while, and outside of Binkley, I work as a professional urban planning consultant. And what that means is I'm like a therapist for cities. Um, I, I, I wish that were less accurate than it is, but that's a lot of times what it is. It's going to other communities and helping people try to discuss their problems in a way that leads to outcomes that serve multiple goals. Um, the big thing I'm working on right now, which I was up in Pittsburgh for uh, on Thursday and Friday, is we're working to rebuild a bus station in a 90% African-American neighborhood in the town of Wilkinsburg, which is very high poverty, a um, lot of social like economic stress, but the busway is a lifeline to healthcare and jobs and education. And we're trying to make it easier for people to walk to the station. So we are trying to tear down barriers in the neighborhood and build new sidewalks and streets to help them with that. Um, the way I got pulled into this was um, Stephanie had asked me to sort of share some of the thoughts I had uh, shared at a prior uh, one of our reimagining sessions about what is going on next door at Binkley. And I'm going to do that. And I have a few slides on that, but I actually think it's more important to talk about why is there something happening at a large scale um, next to Binkley. So I'm going to jump right in. My goal is to try to blaze through the presentation in about 30 minutes so that we can talk more at the end. So um, I will do my best to be interesting. If for some reason there's something I put up here that doesn't make sense at all, raise your hand or um, alert Megan in the chat and Megan will raise her hand or Dor Dorothy will raise her hand and we'll we'll try to talk about it. But um, this is called the future near Bingley, change on our doorstep. Today, change is happening right near Bingley University Place. We're gonna talk about why. There's some key forces at work here that have to do with all sorts of things. How people aspire to live and messages we get about that from broader society, namely through television, I mentioned that. Um, living aspirations um, and household size changes, that's changing. Um, population and job growth here in the triangle. Sometimes I hear folks say, well, we're Chapel Hill, we're not part of the triangle, but you're gonna see Chapel Hill is a very strong um, personal and economic relationship with the rest of the community. So as so goes Raleigh, Cary, Durham, Research Triangle Park, the airport and all the suburbs around them, we're on a journey with them, whether we like it or not. Uh, and then finally, we've had years of inaction on housing in Chapel Hill and that has led to a crisis. It's not a crisis that's only in Chapel Hill, it's in cities around the United States. Many of the same things going on here, going on else places, but it tends to be more acute in college towns and it is worse here. And we'll talk about that too. So um, quick, we're gonna have three audience participation questions today. Question number one, did anybody bring food to a family that had a new baby in the church in the last couple of years? If so, okay, three hands up. What city did they live in? Durham. Durham. Chapel Hill. Chapel Hill, one. Okay, so several Durham's and one Chapel Hill. Um, that's kind of how it goes. Most young families can't afford to live in Chapel Hill anymore. Um, they're more likely to be in Durham. Um, I met a young couple at the Trunk or Treat who I had never seen before. I was like, hey, are, are you guys new here? And they said, well, we drove by the Black Lives Matter banner and we knew we found our people. I'm like, oh, where do you live, Mevin? Um, so keep that in mind. Well, I really should have said Chatham County, actually. So that is not Chapel Hill, because Chatham is cheaper. So that that is a good point. Although they do have Chapel Hill addresses, which totally messes people up. Um, aspirational change. Okay. Um, folks who are, you know, 45 and up, your favorite sitcom from your childhood. Yell it out. Dick Van Dyke. Gilligan's Island. Gilligan's Island. Dick Van Dyke. Okay. So Dick Van Dyke was one of the other ones I was thinking about, but the one that um, I'm sure many of you watch is the Brady Bunch. Uh, what does the Brady Bunch look like? It's a nuclear family, a married couple, many children, right? They live in the suburbs, okay? Let's fast forward about 20 years. Where's Seinfeld say? It's in New York City. It's adults living in their household by themselves, being friends with people across the hall. And of course, the, the sitcom that carried it further, Friends, uh, you know, people living in the urban lot, out the windows, the Brooklyn Bridge is the cover of the DVD, that kind of thing. So over time, we have, in the 60s and 70s and early 80s, um, cities were not places that were considered aspirational in our cultural zeitgeist, and that has reversed over the past 25 years. Cultural changes. Um, how many people had the driver's license by the time they were 18 years old? Just about everybody here in the room, probably, those of you online as well. The day I was 16. The day she was 16. Okay. And I, I remember that too. I was like 16 and a half in Massachusetts, so I was begging my parents how can we do it. But today it's different. Kids and cars. This is USA Today from August of 21. Today's teens no longer don't have to start driving. And these are the eight reasons they gave 
they were too busy to get a driver's license. Having a car is too expensive. I get rides from other people. I like to walk. I like to use public transportation. Climate change and young people. Think about Greta Thunberg. Concerned about how driving impacts the environment when you talk to young people. They talk about this more than I ever thought about it. Um, household size changes. This is the average size of the U.S. family from 1960 to 2021. In the 60s, we're about 3.6, so that means more families than not have four people in them. And by the time we get down to the 90s, we're in 3.1, and we're bouncing up and down, but we're here at 3.13. So that's like two parents, 1.1 children on average when there's a family, but that's not a household. A family is a unit. A household could be people who might not be related. Um, so this is not necessarily a bad thing. When we see this in many countries, this almost means women are receiving more education, uh, information about family planning, contraception is more widely available and not stigmatized. So there's a lot of good that comes with this chart, but we also need to think about that what it means for how we live. And this is where um, I think this chart tells so much of the story about what's going on next door. <clears throat> America's housing tax by the numbers are 72% large single family homes, which cost a lot of money. And they're 20% of what we call multi family housing, or what's been called missing middle housing, duplexes, triplexes, um, like little cottage courts. There's six units around a little courtyard, and they all share the common space. But what, what our households look like? Well, the most common household size in America is one person. 28% of people live by themselves alone. Second most common is couples with no kids. Uh, the third is adult roommate and nuclear families, two parents married with a child or one or more, is high for third. And then single parent families is 7%. So our housing stock in the blue, 72% of the stuff, is built for 20% of the households. We have a real strong mismatch. Um, population and job growth. So the housing stock isn't really well connected with how people are growing, living, changing, and aspiring to live. And then this isn't a problem if you're in a place where a lot of people aren't moving in, but we are the opposite of a place where people aren't moving in. We are the place where everybody is moving to. Um, this is a great place for jobs. Apple is coming to RCP. There's a company called Wolfspeed, which used to be called Cree, which makes the LED lights in your home. <clears throat> They're building a $5 billion plant in Chatham County, which is the second largest thing going on in Chatham County. Um, how many people here have heard of the VinFast plant? Uh, this is a Vietnamese automaker. They're going to build a battery building facility for electric cars in Chatham County. They have cleared 2,000 acres of Chatham County to build the battery plant. Does anyone know how big the UNC main campus is in acres? 240 acres. So 10 times the UNC campus to build a battery plant in Chatham. People are coming here for work. It's not stopping. Um, fastest growing cities in the US, Hook'em Horn, Austin, Texas. Marcus goes where the people go. <laughs> Raleigh, Raleigh and Kerry is number two. He's like a population growth mag. Austin boomed first and now he's here. Thank you for stimulating the economy, sir. Uh, but yeah, number two place in the country for migration, people moving here. So. Um, yeah, but I will go back because that last line, most common origin. Yes, German Chapel Hill is the place that people are moving to Raleigh and carry from. But there are also people coming from around the U.S. And there are plenty of people coming into Durham and Chapel Hill. Like uh, 20 people move to Durham and Orange counties every day. 17 of those 20 wind up in Durham. Uh, 60 people move to Wake County every day. So that means that if it's 80 people a day in the triangle, one way to think of it is at the end of every week, we need a new elementary school. Is that wow. taking into consideration people move away and die as well? Yes, so that's, that's what we call cohort population survival analysis. Deaths plus births in migration minus out migration. And, and you know, I get that wrong. 560 people or 460 people, that, that includes adults. So maybe once every month we need to an elementary school. That's still an incredible burden. Um, so lots of demand. We've talked about jobs, we've talked about population, but what about supply? And I'm going to focus on Chapel Hill and Barbara. Um, so one of the best urban uh, studies researchers in the United States actually grew up in Durham, and now he lives in Chicago. His name is Yona Freemark. And if you read his writing, you will learn a lot. Um, Yona and the Urban Institute published this report back in October. Which types of municipalities are adding residential units which are mounting barriers to housing called homing in? 
And um, so I wrote to Yona via Twitter, the incredible communication tool that it is. And I said, Yona, I took a quick look and only saw Lumberton mentioned for North Carolina. Is there any analysis of other North Carolina communities in this work? I'm particularly interested in Durham, Chapel and Carborough. And here was his response. The cities that underperform most in North Carolina overall are Lumberton, Carborough, Chapel Hill, Southern Pines, and Cary. All of them are building at lower construction rates than their respective metro areas. And all of housing value is 30% higher. So what does that look like if you're actually trying to make a decision as a family to buy a home? Uh, this is December, so a couple months ago. It's from Realtor.com. Uh, Raleigh's median sale price is 385000 uh, those of us in the room can't see it at the top of the screen, but Durham is 374000 Carver was 420000 and if you want to buy a median price home in Chapel Hill, you'll need $630,000. To put that in perspective of who can afford what, the median income in Orange County is about 79000 this year, and the income required to afford sold home in Chapel Hill would be 146000 That assumes you have 127000 in cash for the down payment. So that's how hard it is to buy a home. Um, so, audience participation question number two. If you've ever bought a home, uh, how old were you when you first bought it? Yell, yell out a number. Your age. 27? 22? 38? 25? 33? Okay. Uh, how old were we? 33? 33, 31? Okay, so I heard a couple of 20s, but a lot of 30s. Uh, this is the chart of the median age of all home buyers in the United States since the 80s. So in the 80s, it was 30, 32, 34, 36. There's a spike in the 90s, but look at the great financial crisis, this big gray piece here. In 2009, it's at 38 and it just skyrockets. We're now at the median age home buyer is closer to retirement than college graduation. And that's sober. Um, and so since we don't build enough housing, locally, as we've talked about with Yona's research. Chapel Hill imports its workforce every morning. This is from the Chamber's State of the Community uh, Breakfast, which is a great way to learn about trends going on locally that they do every year. Um, but basically what happens every morning is 43,000 people drive or take a bus into Chapel Hill. Uh, in Carborough, 14,000 drive out, and only 6,400 of the people who wake up here work here. So right now we are um, having to import people and that causes problems for our employers. This is from that same event. The uh, hospital said that there are 897 registered nursing positions open in Orange County in October. So think of what that means when you go to the hospital to get care, right? And uh, Emily and I went to the emergency room last summer and we experienced some of that firsthand. Um, so question number three, does anybody know the medical support staff at your doctor's office or uh, anywhere where you go live. And you, anybody know a local Chapel Hill Carborough school teacher, do you know where they live? Southern. Yeah, so Hillsborough. Hillsborough. Rocky Mount. Rocky Mount. Uh, Washborough, Alamance, Kennedy, Chatham, Kennedy. Yes, so that, well, for those online who might not, I can't know, I can't tell how well you guys can hear the room, but we heard Mevin, Hillsborough, Roxborough, Alamance County. Um, because I'm a transportation dork, when I get my blood drawn, I'm like, would you mind telling me where you live? <laughs> I've got a report down that people don't really feel threatened by it anymore. Uh, first few times it was weird. But uh, at my doctor's office, the answers are Siler City, 48 minute commute to Carborough Pediatrics, Roxborough, 57 minute commute to there, and uh, Burlington is the last one. So people are coming from far away. And uh, you know, when you think about climate, as the car burning the fuel all over. Uh, we got to build some housing somewhere, though, around here, right? Well, in Chapel Hill, it's nearly impossible to build in the gray parts of the map, and that is the town of Chapel Hill limits on the screen. So how much of the map is gray? It's like 94%. Um, and the only, the only way you can build in the gray is if you build, one thing that's really easy to build is a single-family home that's over 3,500 square feet and costs over $600,000. And when you see that $630,000 median home price, the fact that this is permittable easily is one of the key reasons. So um, this is a hard part, but it's true. Local residents of Chapel Hill Carborough have consistently opposed most new housing development for decades. And the chickens are coming home to roost um, within our community. And so where we are is that the colorful, what Chapel Hill calls the future focus areas on the map are the only places in Chapel Hill where anything of any size is allowed to happen. Just to point out, this is like a little slice next to Southern Village. 
just north of Florida Boulevard, which is Franklin Street. MLK in yellow, and then up by um, Weaver Dairy, and if you see the stuff going in by I-40, called Caraway Village, in the town. And then over here on 15501, well, the green is called the 15501 North Future Focus Area, and Big Leaf is right in the middle of it. So that means that all the development pressure from the jobs moving to Chatham County, from the fact that this is an attractive place to live, to people coming to live here, We've taken all that energy and instead of allowing it to settle in multiple parts of the town, we focused it like a laser on these five or six places. Um, and thankfully, it's in the green one. So that's why things are happening. Now, what is happening? Um, this is the site plan that I was looking at, and it's, it's changed a little bit since originally, but let me talk a little bit about what's in it. First, orientation. Uh, Bingley is the square up the top. Uh, for those of you online, you should be able to see Bingley Church in um, a blue, large rectangle, the Harris Theater to the left. Um, the saddest part of this plan is the likely Chick fil A in purple directly south of us. Um, other things here that are interesting that are responding to some of the things we just talked about. There are two apartment homes building. One is called Nine Hundred Willow. It will have about 250 apartments along Willow Drive to the uh, west side of the Silver Cloud Cinema. There's another apartment building planned over here just past the gas station, kind of where the recycling bins are. Um, and then the big thing they're going to do is they're going to cut them all open. They're going to cut through the middle and they're going to put basically swap through. They're going to put two new block of scores over here. This is like where Southern School season was and it's gone. But they're going to put a ring space in here and have like a little pocket shop at one end. Um, and then a lot of the stuff that you see in sort of flesh tone, that's new stuff. The stuff that's in white, like Silver Spot and Planet Fitness and Kid Dude, that's all staying. Those things aren't going away. Um, so there are some there are some interesting things here. We're uh, talking about 350,000 square feet of retail space. Um, that's actually, I think, a, a net positive for the community. A lot of people have shuttered stores in their community because the pandemic accelerated people getting things delivered at home. And a lot of retail places went out of business. How many people lost a, a restaurant they enjoyed during the pandemic? Hands up, yeah. So. Um, 500 apartment homes, 10% uh, of them will be affordable. So 50% of them will be managed by either the housing land trust or by legal so that they're available to people below the median income. That's a real positive. Um, 1.2 acres of parking are going away and it will be green. So to the extent that you know how we have a flooding issue out here along SD's Drive, the fact, the fact that we take away some impervious surface and the developer puts in some green will help manage the stormwater a bit better than we have today. It'll actually be less pavement when they're done than it's there today. Um, there's some incubator spaces for small businesses, and one of the uh, that's along here. One of the perks there is they are reserving 20% of them for minority businesses. That's kind of a cool uh, and different thing. And then finally, they're going to be building a green lane along Ford Boulevard. Uh, earlier on, when we talked about young people not driving, e-bike sales are booming, and you know that's something where younger people are looking for a way to get around. And lo and behold, it'll carry them right behind by the front door of our church and our Black Lives Matter banner. So um, I'm just going to quickly go through these. The way to look at this is where you see where it says view in the arrow, that's where the picture taken is looking. So I know this is kind of like people who don't read maps all day, like I do, this is a little weird. But imagine if you're kind of over near where the, the top end of the mall is and basically behind you looking south, this is what you see. If you were over along Willow Drive here, <laughs> kind of near the PNC ATM bank and looking down this way, this is what you see. <laughs> um, some of the stuff that's in the park, I think that's mostly parking right now, but uh, okay. yeah, and then this is kind of what's there today. There's WCHL, but you'll notice there's a corner here, and that's kind of where the green space and parking will open up there. And then over here, where there'll be a hotel in the future, this is kind of looking through this way back into the middle. So, um There'll be a good deal of street trees, but there'll also be a good deal of new and, and slightly taller buildings between three and seven stories. Um, so, big picture University Place is looking at all those trends we talked about in the first 10 or 20 slides, and they're responding to um, the residents of the, the apartments. They're going to be smaller households, two to three people, which is much more in keeping with our current household size in America. Who's going to live there? Probably recent UNC graduates. Retirees who want to be people who are living alone but want to be around more people so they don't feel alone. Um, and 
they'll be able to walk to places, especially as we get older, it gets harder to drive. My vision is starting to change. I'm aware of that now more than ever. Um, workers will have retail employees here. There's also going to be kind of a co-working space that I think they want to attract tech companies. I think that's very plausible in Chapel Hill. Um, there's also farmer markets. Farmer's market is going to be there. And then hotel guests, if there's a hotel one there. So. <clears throat> so what's it like to be a church in the middle of things? We're a little bit kind of to ourselves right now, but there's some churches around here that are in the middle of things. This is University Methodist on Chapel Hill. The church here kind of flows right out into the sidewalk. So uh, there's a lot of activity there. There's a lot of people going by. A lot of people engage. <clears throat> this is a church I was looking at that was very interesting. This is North Church in Indianapolis, and they have the farmer's market in their parking lot. Um, but I think the thing that this sort of exemplifies is that the churches here are placing themselves in the rhythm of the life of the community. They're not waiting for people to come into their building. They're coming out and saying, okay, you're doing this farmer's market, and for whatever reason, it doesn't fit there. Why don't you have it in our parking lot? And people are now coming to them, or they're finding a way. So, I believe this is the opportunity that University Place, despite all the change and despite, I'm sure we're gonna have like a construction issue at some point and people are gonna have to drive in a new way. It's gonna be a little frustrating. This is the long-term This is the long -term opportunity. Um, and so what ministry opportunities might exist? And I admit my next few slides here, I am totally spitballing. And part of the discussion will be what other ideas do you do? But um, <clears throat> people wanna belong, people wanna be healthy. And there's gonna be a thousand people living here that haven't lived here before. Can we start a walking club that loops through this new environment that's a lot nicer to walk through with fewer parking spaces, more green spaces? And can we have the loop run through our campus so they get to know us and we get exercise and they get to know we're here? Um, trunk or treat. It's a lot of fun. Some of those apartments, because they're going to be affordable, are going to have small children. Why don't we invite them over? Or better yet, why don't we call the apartment complex and say, hey, on this day, October 27th before Halloween, we're having trunk or treat. Do you want to do a hall treat and have everybody walk back and forth so the kids get twice as much candy and feel like they're getting out there more than just kind of parading around the parking lot or parading around your apartments? They could walk along the greenway if they wanted to between them. Um, I'm really reaching here. There's a group of nuns in Massachusetts who've been making chocolate for 60 years. And I was thinking, well, wouldn't it be great if Binkley could be in the farmer's market or Chapel Hill farmer's market and have a booth every Saturday, but you got to grow or produce something. And we've got Karen and Linda. So I'm sure we could produce something. We, we have to listen to what they say. But my point here is that um, we have a friend named Connie who gave us a chocolate from Trappist monks in Kentucky or something. Mm -hmm. So there are religious communities that are producing things. And it's not that you want to make money on chocolate. It's that by being at a table at the farmer's market, you get to talk to people about, hey, do you know we're doing this thing with bail bonds? Does that sound cool to you? Would you like to get involved with user code? Well, by the way, the chocolate's ten dollars. Um, so that's that's like how do you turn this gathering place into an engagement place for us and for the things that we care about? Last thing, um, Ram Development's eventually going to be opening up these retail spaces for leads, and some of them are going to sit empty for a year, and they're going to be like, "What do we do to make an interest?" Uh, Dorothy, you're talking about the art room. We have a great set of rotating art that goes through our sanctuary. Could we say, hey, we can put some art in one of your vacant spaces in a gallery. We might leave some information about the church over there. Would you be up for that? Instead of having a series of blank walls sitting in one of your storefronts, making it look like the mall is less busy. But we'd have to talk to them about that. But talking with them has a more dividends because it, eventually the building and grounds is a big part. And <clears throat> Bingley today is buffered and hidden. Here's the K&W, which I'll talk about what's coming next in just a moment. You can kind of see us through the trees, but even if um, even if we have that outward looking, physically, it's going to be hard to see us. And sadly, we have the Chick-fil-A challenge. They're going to put this awful double loaded drive through thing there. And why the town allowed that to happen, I have no idea. They should have done better than that, but it's done. So what this means is that from the point of view of the developer, is going to print money for 15 or 20 years. And so once it's built, we should be prepared that it's going to be there for a while. And so if we have to embrace or want to embrace the rest of the community, this side of our building, the side that faces the free school, the ramp down towards the Harris Cedar in this corner, this is our big opportunity. Okay, so it's right here. Here's the Harris Cedar. Here's kind of, we have some half through there, but it's not really clear. It doesn't tell you that we have a school. It doesn't tell you that we have a church. It doesn't have 
a gateway. And I think we want to do that. I think we want to perhaps engage a landscape architect. We want to dream a bit about what might feel special to us. If you were walking into Binkley from the Harris Theater parking lot, which and I know I never feel really elevated to the Harris Theater parking lot, but if you were walking into something here, what would make you feel excited? You'd probably like, oh, that looks cool, this kind of stuff. Um, that's the kind of thing we can do because one day they're going to redevelop this parking lot too. And the buildings there now are going to be three to seven story. When they develop this, it's going to be 12. Maybe even 20. Mm -hmm. The world is changing. But if there's a 12 story apartment building with people who are looking for purpose right outside our door, where can they look at to see? So um, this is something that's probably, I think, a one to three year thing. Creating a gateway, we want to develop some sketch plans for, for how to do this. We'd probably go talk to Ram and say, hey, you know, we, we disagree with you about the chicken play. We understand that's done. When you guys do something else, we have some ideas. Before you go talk to the town again, we want you to talk to us. And that sets the table for us, for our ideas being at the table when it matters, when the council can control what they do next. Um, and really, it's be prepared to be ready. So we can get more if we will go on in the long run. And that's it. Uh, how are we doing on time? 10. About a half hour. That worked out. Uh, if you're interested in what University Place is doing, there's a website here. It's vision.universityplacenc.com. Um, you can go and look at some of the things and see some of the information I told you here today. Um, if anybody is really interested in the first part of the presentation about the problem and what is more affordable housing in Chapel Hill Carborough look like, I'm actually leading a tour of it in Carborough next Sunday at 4 p.m. Um, there's a group I work with, and uh, we are looking at what's called Missing Middle Housing, the neighborhood that Emily and I have lived in since, well, since I've lived in since 2001. Um, while I've been in the neighborhood, I've lived in an 11-plex, a townhome, a single-family house, um, but we have different types of housing all up and down the street, and the rents in our neighborhood are cheaper than most of the two towns, and part of that is because small units, when they get old, get cheap. So if we can build more small units today, we can house the teachers of tomorrow. Anyway, we'll be we talking about that next week. But at this point, I am done and I'm interested in your questions, your comments, your reactions. Okay, could I say a couple of things? Go first? for it, Dorothy. <clears throat> um, first of all, Kimberly's, sorry, <clears throat> Kimberly responded to your question about where the staff of providers live. And she said Hurdle Bills, Lewisburg, Durham, and Burlington, which is um, there are a few new ones there. We want to include the online folks in this discussion. Yeah. So those of you online, if you would um, type your questions to everyone in the chat, I'll share those with Patrick. Emily. Well, how much would it cost to engage a landscape architect? My guess is it's under twenty thousand dollars, it might even be under fifteen or under ten. Um, I have worked with a lot of folks who design civic buildings, um, train stations, uh, courthouses, uh, town halls. There are probably some people out there who are more into or have more experience designing church buildings or religious buildings of any type, um, because sometimes the interface of those spaces and what religious communities use them for are different than what you know, the town of Chapel Hill used for. And so if we could find somebody, I have no idea, like you guys were placing ads for our music minister in one of the Baptist publications. Are there religious architects in that publication? If so, if we talk to somebody like that. But I do think it's like a, an under $20,000 to get a sketch. Um, there is also a gentleman I know who lives in Durham who um, does some stuff like this who might be suitable. But I would ask him what he thinks it costs before we would go look more. And are there more questions in the chat? And I see a gentleman has a question. Here. Not yet, just compliments so far. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Um, the area that's just to the left of the um, the road out there, the nearest to the church, mm -hmm. doesn't that belong to the university place? It does. Uh, so, um, so, yeah, that's that. Do that. Yeah. Well, this is one of those things that, you know, we don't need their permission to think about anything, but we do need their permission to do something, right? 
So our land here, you make a very good point. Our land is in the blue rectangle at the top. And if you look under the blue rectangle, there's sort of that little clump of trees to the left of the Chick-fil-A. And I don't know if it was Charles or somebody else when we were talking about this earlier, they said that that is a stormwater feature. And I'm sure that it is. But as you see with University Place putting in new green spaces, they are they're smart. And they're trying to not make the town upset as they try to make a dollar out here. Um, they're aware of the flooding on Estes, and they know that the place they build will be a more marketable place if it doesn't flood. So part of what they're going to do as whenever the future rounds of development come, they're going to be asking themselves, how can we make more of the pavement go away and manage stormwater better? So that is doing a tiny amount of things. It's not nothing, but it ain't much. So if we had a plan for, we might like to see something different there. It's on your land. We might allow you to use some of our land to help manage stormwater if we could come to an agreement about how to do that. That might help us get we want what we want while helping them getting something they need. And they might pay to do the work. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So that's, that's a great point, a great conversation. That is a, a focal conversation point we would need to have with them. I wonder, we've actually been in mediation with Lamb mm -hmm. since October. Would it be helpful? I just point out some of the things that we're doing as we're in conversation with right now. So then that would add to, I think, the discussion of where we are. Yeah, I, I mean, this is where I, I just don't know enough about that conversation yeah. to make a suggestion. I, I, this is a perfect slide that I could just show you real quickly. Yeah. What, what, uh, yeah, go ahead, talk about it. Yes. So we actually lost the battle of trying not to have a Chick-fil-A right there. Okay. So we, we actually made a proposal. They shipped that over here for a lot of reasons. But anyway, that that's sort of over. So um, so we're so we're down to a discussion of, of three things right now. One, sort of at the front end, seeming an opposition to what you're talking about, but Let's, let's think about what's going to happen. There is going to be a double wide drive through that will pack up about 40 cars starting about 11 or 1130 every day and running right by our church. Okay. Breakfast. Yeah. Breakfast. Breakfast. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. Yeah. Every day, yeah. morning till night. Yeah. Okay. Because we know that Chick fil A is going to be extraordinarily bad. They put this driveway into here. Uh, and so that, and, the, and, the, and it's going to circle through here. So, so in the short run, uh, probably for the next 15, 20 years, we're suggesting strongly that they actually build a wall between us and that Chick-fil-A, but only between us and the Chick-fil-A. Because the other thing that's going to go on is that they will have about an 18 foot high covering, two of them, with lights. Uh, and a, a lot of noise. So we're suggesting that an area about right here down actually has a wall. But we're suggesting that they create a walkway, an access to the mall right through this piece of property right here. Okay? Yeah. That they, they become pedestrian and that it be green laid, if you will, and like, it'd be similar to this one. So this walkway, we're suggesting that there be, this came out of the earlier uh, thoughts you provide us, to build it right through here and to rework this little uh, holding pond right here, which we think is possible. And we're going to meet with them in the next two weeks to see if that is possible. Now, what I can't reach, what I'll point to, is that you see our driveway coming right in here? Mm -hmm. If you've ever tried to make a right turn into this driveway, it's almost impossible. You have to cast your fate to the wind and make the right turn. Now, that hasn't been very important to us because people drive in here, they come down here, and they've been able to turn left in here. Mm -hmm. This traffic is going to increase significantly, and more and more people are going to use this route into the church if they're driving a car. And so we've made a proposal to them that they make that more accessible uh, and uh, allow the cars to make the turn into the church with less difficulty. 
They also are going to extend this greenway right past the church. So the same thing that happened is happening in front of their property. Uh, the city uh, has the agreement of Ram Realty to extend that greenway all the way up to the corner of Willow and uh, what Fordham. We anticipate that uh, that that intersection will eventually be expanded, and so uh, at that point, uh, logic would have us would say that they're going to, in the future, prohibit left turns into this drive and shuttle it down to other places. Uh, but the most exciting thing you're pointing to is that we're going to have a lot of people living here. And they don't have to drive anywhere. They can just get up and go. And as you point out, we can get up and go. Exactly. So I just wanted to, oh yeah, the other thing is this, these, uh, these hiding bushes mm -hmm. that now uh, you know, uh, do not allow you to see this church from mm -hmm. anywhere over here. Pardon me. Uh, uh, we have said, we are we have recommended that this is, these are their trees. They're not trees. They're well, they are. They're holly trees. Be removed and signage for Bentley be placed there. And you can see the church, and there'll be a sign for the church facing the mall. So that's where we are in our negotiations right now. And before anything is done, of course, we carry to the church council. But that's where we are in negotiations, and we're going to find out. It looks like either this coming week or the next week, what they have really talked about since we started our mediation. So we'll be able to come back with more information very soon. Great update there from Charles. Thank you, Charles. Dorothy, do we have anything else in the chat? No, okay. not yet. Um, I have a question sure. for you. I'm a UNC grad. Mm -hmm. Back in the day, it was beautiful here. It was a whole lot smaller. How dense is it going to get? here do you think um so it depends right um there are multiple ways to change density so the the neighborhood that we live in that we're touring with the, uh, the walk next sunday um that neighborhood is what we call a gentle density neighborhood it's actually reasonably high density but it's because there's a lot of small homes Right, so there's a, a quadplex on the corner of block from me and Emily that has four homes. Uh, like I said, there's a little, it, you know, where the um, O2 Fitness, it used to be Carolina Fitness in Carborough. It's got like a drive-through chiropractor in the. Oh, it's the yeah. yeah, so that's, that's the most amazing business. It used to be a drive-through bank, and now it's a chiropractor. Yeah. Don't know how that works, but um, probably go probably go inside the building. But um, that neighborhood there has a lot of. Uh, there's a 40-unit apartment building in our neighborhood. It's four stories tall. And there are plenty of trees in our neighborhood. Our, our neighborhood is dense and green. Um, the other thing is that when you walk by the pool, that 40, uh, play, 40 apartment complex in the summer, there are a lot of retired people who live by themselves and they're all hanging out in the pool having the time of their lives. It's like, you know, it's, it's like, a, like I'll be walking to work or something. When I was before, before the pandemic, I'd be walking to work and like, like 8.30 in the morning, they're in the pool, you know, in July, having a great time. Like, oh man, I can get work. Mm. But um, so those places become retirement communities where people who live alone can still be together with people. Um, I think in places like this, those those colored areas on the map, because there's so little opportunity in the gray area, which can change if the town makes different rules. That's a town that's a choice the town is making to focus the pressure in these places. Um, then places like University Place don't have to be as big and as tall if there's more housing allowed elsewhere. If we continue to make it really hard to build any other parts of town. Um, the financial imperatives of investing in the handful of places that you can build will be taller and taller. Um, right now, we only see sort of mid-rise and quasi skyscrapers in Chapel Hill on Franklin Street. Like if you think of the Green Bridge, Bridge Building or um, 140 West Franklin, mm -hmm. which has the sculpture that kind of steams and little kids like to miss. Um, the way I think about those places is that like Greenbridge is 99 homes and it's on 1.3 acres. And if they didn't live there, they would take down another 231 acres in Chatham County to put them in single family houses. So we have kind of like, the challenge we, we face, I think if I sum it up the most, 
is you can commit to keeping the character, the physical character of the buildings in the community the same. But when you do that, it's a commitment to change the characters who live in the community to be older, wealthier, and whiter. And that's the tension that kind of comes with that. So if we can navigate physical change in a way where we can accept new dangers and it still feels good to us, we don't have to choose between being inclusive and, you know, being the way it feels like home. Right. So, and that's not always easy. Change is not easy. Actually, I want to ask your thoughts about one other thing. You know, when the reimagining committee was, was meeting, <clears throat> we said, and look at this church. This church is very, it's over 60 years old, except for the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And it's very costly to maintain. Uh, and uh, we have to continue maintaining it if we're going to continue to use it. But would a, would a better idea be to think about the building itself as not being this building, but enter into a partnership perhaps with somebody and reconstruct a different kind of church? In which we would be a part, we were still on the land, but we would be a part of the ownership of the building, but not the entire occupants of the building. And we're seeing this kind, we've looked at other places around the United States where this is happening right now, where there are churches inside of buildings that uh, are both residential and commercial. I'm not suggesting a commercial site, but I am suggesting maybe with a 60 year old church and we're pumping a lot of money into the maintenance of the church, would it be wiser for us to think about reconstructing the church in partnership with maybe a nonprofit or even a for profit organization to help us rethink uh, our future? So there, there are, that's a, a big kind of woolly question, right? And there are some really interesting things going on. Let me, let me talk about a couple of them. So um, I'm originally from the Boston area. And most of us are sadly familiar with what happened with um, the abuse scandal in Boston Archdiocese. And so as part of the law settlement that happened, the Boston Archdiocese had to sell off a lot of its land. And many of the churches have much smaller tenants now than they did, you know, 40, 50 years ago. Um, and so what's happened is some of the churches are incredibly beautiful architecture. And some developers have said, well, we might like to buy them. And some of them get bought wholesale. And now there's like the I don't think they called them the St. Catherine's Lofts because that would be just too on the nose. But there are places where the type of partnership you're talking about has happened. So there was one of the churches, and I've forgotten which one it is, um, but they had a large uh, sanctuary in a kind of old Gothic Catholic looking building, and they had a small chapel. And they realized that their congregation mostly could fit snugly in the chapel. Um, and, you know, Christmas and Easter were a little crowded, but other than that, it was pretty good. And so they entered into what was like a 99 year ground lease of the sanctuary to a developer while keeping the chapel and they remain in control of the land but the developer when they rebuilt the the, the big church the like condos they now manage the maintenance of the grounds off the church's dollar so that was something where a small congregation and there that, that was a congregation that is much smaller than we are um, probably like 40 or 50 people um a more kind of example that i learned of just about a week or two ago at work is um the company I work for is an engineering company in 14 countries. And um, I do a lot of what's known as transit-oriented development. How do we develop in a healthy way around bus and rail lines? But my Canadian counterpart is a gentleman named David Cooperman in Toronto. And our company is helping to build a subway line up there. And on the edge of Toronto, um, part of where they're building, they're going to build on the land that the Transit Authority owns. But um, they've been approached by a local mosque of immigrants. And they said, our building is falling apart. Can we be part of your new community? And so the architects are actually sitting down with um, Islamic immigrants to Canada, asking them what the design of a park commercial art building that the church will have, or the mosque will have like a 50 year lease to that portion of the building. And what type of Islamic design from the architecture to how the spaces feel to, you know, how it all works together. It feels culturally appropriate to people who've come from Saudi Arabia to Toronto. What an incredible question. Um, so I don't know that that's the right answer for us here, but I do know that more religious communities and builders are asking those questions together. So if we decided to do it, we wouldn't be like, 
going into fully uncharted territory. We'd have models we could look at. Um, I don't know that that's the right thing for us or not. And I don't think we, I don't know that we need to decide that yet, but if it's, it's a- You're gonna have a very low structure in the middle of a brand new beautiful. Um, <clears throat> and I think that the only thing that was only bullet point I would add to your first point, which I think people are, young people are also looking for purpose and meaning. Uh, and I think that's where Binkley, and this is the point we've tried to make to Rand. We think Binkley can bring something to the people that are occupying these spaces that no other place in that new place will be provided. And that will be uh, spiritual development, community development, that there is no community development space being built here, but we have it. Yeah. And uh, I think we'd be more successful if we drop the Baptist community. And that's another one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think a lot of people agree with you, but that's that's it's something. It's too much. No, I agree. Great. That we're not wanting to invite. Oh, yeah. No, but but Charles, I think Charles asked a really good question, and you know, we have we have a small school on our campus, yeah. right? And a lot of schools are going through. The COVID pandemic, thinking like, are they going to redo their ventilation systems or something? We would probably be better to tear the school down and build new than to redo the ventilation system because the, the cost of doing one of those things is probably 80% of doing something new. So, um, you know, I think as we think about the long term financial health of the church, um, one thing we talk about in urban planning is activation. How can we take a space that often is usually just for parking cars? which sit idle 23 out of 24 hours a day or the space is empty. And how can we turn it into a place that people can use that they feel like they can own? Um, the other thing I think, Charles, that you made your, your point is knocking on the door at is that there in the United States, we're really bad at making public spaces that you can be in where you don't have to pay. Like, you, you, oh, you can come and sit at this cafe as long as you spend $9 in the pocket, right? Um, but can we create places where people can be without having to spend money? Um, churches have a, a, a capability to do that the way that a, a developer is more concerned. Marcus did a Wednesday night, okay, it was Tuesday night then, we've gone back to Wednesday night's presentation in the fall on being Baptist, comma, staying Baptist. It was well attended. There were about 40 people here for the dinner and program that night. And that's on YouTube. You might want to look for that. We're at a time check. We're about 10.22. I can take more questions, but if folks feel like they're done, it can be done too, but happy to talk as long as people want. Patrick, if you could wave a wand, what would you want us to do? Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, hmm, that's tough, right? <laughs> <laughs> Lots of bad urban planning decisions have come from one person waving a wand. Robert Moses of New York City is the guy exemplar of that process. But um, I'll try to do my best to, to give you some ideas. Um, I went to Wake Forest and uh, the best thing I got for my degree is the front row. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but one of the things of being on campus is that it's very beautiful and Wake Forest has some really lovely public spaces. But the other thing that they have is like when you walk onto the cloth, you almost always walk under a barge with a lantern and it's telling you you're someplace special. Years ago, Silas Creek Park, we ran through the middle and there was a stoplight like in the middle of the quad. And when you think about, oh, when you see pictures from the 50s and you see what it is now, and like, oh my God, why did anyone ever think that was a good idea? Because the place is so special today. Um, when young graduates get married, they go and they put their picture on the quad, stuff like that. But we, I think we could do something in that area where I've been talking about the idea of the gateway that, um, sort of announces the church's presence as a special and a holy place in a way more than our physical environment does today. Um, the other thing I think around here is how many people have seen the Iron Steeple in Southern Village at the Methodist Church there? Um, That's you, another one. It's like right in the middle of Southern Village. Yes. The church there, like building an old steeple, it's, they, it's like stone, 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 and then you get up to the top, it's steel, and they have a carol on there. Um, and, you know, I don't know that we need to hire a bell ringer and all of that modern Carolines. We press a button and it sounds pretty much the same. It's not exactly the same, but it's close. But as this community grows up, we are 
it's easy to hide us right now with a tall tree. And I think that, you know, one of the reasons, like, you go back to those churches that are in the middle of things, right? I overshot, but like on Franklin Street, the you know, University of Methodist, you see the steeple. Um, Trinity in Durham is beautiful because as you're walking through downtown Catholic Courthouse, you look to the left and the street literally goes up at what we call a terminated vista in architecture where the, the steeple is at the end of the street. And whoever designed the church put the steeple there so that when you looked up the street, you would be sort of um, elevated in awe of it. Um, but I feel like if there's a way for us, yeah, like that steeple there. You can't know. Or um, you know, you can't see this the screen there, but they have a, a, a tower too. I think something like that would let people know we're here with a sort of a symbology through architecture that people associate more with an ecclesiastical space than what are currently building signals to people off the property. And Emily, you had a hand up. Just absorbing all of this, is this really going to change our um, how we conduct a preschool? Because <clears throat> Just don't want a bunch of strangers staring at you, right? That's. <laughs> I'm not sure what you're saying. We're going to be we're going to be in this this new public space, right? We've got our children's playground right there, and um, I, I'm thinking immediately of the car pollution, the air from the Chick Fil A drive through. I'm thinking about all these single people who need something to do, and all these children. <laughs> you know, you just have to think about that. And you also in an era of mass shootings. I'm also thinking about with more commercial spaces, you know, we need to be aware of the impact that yeah, we won't be a you know, I just feel like I'm being realistic here. Um, yeah. our responsibility to the parents of these children um, is pretty critical. Yeah, we, we try really hard to make that stick a part of the program. Pollution, and we had the data on idling cars versus moving cars, and, and all that data. That they really were unmoved by that, uh, and that's why we really ultimately came to the idea of that particular property in this church. We have to have a wall. We have to we have to keep as much of that light and pollution on that side of the barrier than on this side. But we need to open up our church on the other side. But in opening it up, then we have the more, it's more evidentiary that we have children here. So we have to think about that as well. How do we make sure that we provide physical protection for these children who are mostly outside? So, so uh, the, the, the good news is that this question has been answered in, in many other contexts for literally hundreds of years. The, I'll say two things. I, I think. If you're going to have the, 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 the drive through over here, I think the wall is a decent and inevitable choice. On the pollution, the problem is largely going to be solved as we switch to electric cars and point emissions are going to mostly go away. Now, <laughs> charging at home with like 12 power, fire power plants is another problem for the planet. But from a local emissions perspective in transportation, the change of the fleet over the next 15 years, emissions are going to go lower and lower and lower. Um, the, the thing that I worry about most with children with the increased amount of activity here is not kidnappings, it is not mass shootings, it is a child being running over by a car. Have you seen how high truck fronts are these days? There are new trucks that are as the height of my shoulder as the hood. And that's more common than not. Um, so what's what's going to happen is as we think about redesigning this entrance on the side of the building is if you can send me what they're proposing, I'd be happy to tell you if I think a child can be seen over the hood of a Ford F-150, um, because I do some of that as part of a day job. But I, I would be most worried about, like, how do we keep kids from getting run over? That's I, that's, I think, the number one threat to children on the property today and in the future. I guess that was another thought about the wall. Is that we, we, we just cannot have, we cannot have the opportunity for a child to run down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We no, just it's, cannot have. I, th I think I think if they're doing a chicken play, the wall is the right call. No worries. We've got to have plants down there to keep storing on it. Yeah, I mean if there's if there's a way to plant on the wall that doesn't um, deteriorate the wall over time, like you can put plants on a wood wall in a way that it'll be fine. Another's on which it'll eat the wall away. But um, 
yeah, I, and I think the, the problem we'll have with the, the drive through will be uh, the threat of people being run over and the noise. Sadly, yeah, <laughs> yeah, let's let's hope they stick with that closed on Sundays deal, right? Um, we're at 10 30, so I don't want to uh, run over time unless people want to talk about it. Anything from else online, Dorothy? So you have gotten <clears throat> several great presentation comments. Oh, right. Charles got um, a comment saying thank you for your advocacy. And Margaret says, messages of love and inclusion on the wall facing Chick-fil-A would be amazing. <laughs> oh, I love it. We have to own the wall. I mean, yeah, that, that means we have to maintain the wall. So uh, anyway. But if, but if there was like a Bingley strike force that went in and painted rainbows in the middle of the night, I would never be involved in something like that, but my phone number is. <laughs> anyway, uh, no, that's, that's a, I love Margaret's sentiment there. That's wonderful. I, I think Tom is right. We would have to consider that, but if there was a way to put a message on that wall, that would be cool. I don't know that that could be achieved. Charles, that's my senior report. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.